Well, I want to thank you for joining us. Today is Tuesday, September the 8th. We're so grateful that you joined us tonight for our Bible study, the continuous reading of uh, the book of Exodus. We're getting into some of the meat of the book of Exodus and a very important lesson for today. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings upon us. May your continued strength be on us in this season of separation from one another. We look forward to that time when we can gather back together again without these uh, walls that divide us, these masses that divide us, and just bring us back together again, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a look at the book of Exodus chapter 12. So last week, a little bit of background. Remember how we left you off with Moses. Moses had expressed his resistance to be used by God because one of the reasons he gave, I'm not eloquent in my language. And so God provided him a man named Aaron. Aaron was his brother. According to the Bible, he's actually his older brother, from what we can figure, maybe about three or four years older, and so he wasn't subject to the purge that was taking place of little baby boys that were being born in Egypt at the time as Moses was. So Aaron became Moses' PR representative. Aaron did all the speaking, and Moses, well, he carried the big stick. And so maybe you, if you've read the book of Exodus, you know how Moses carried this big staff that was often used as, as a demonstrate, to demonstrate God's power. And so multiple places where that staff becomes representative of God's power being used by Moses and so forth. So we also, between last week's lesson and this week, run into a series of confrontations between Moses and the Pharaoh. So Moses goes to Egypt and asks for the Jewish people to be released from their slavery. And Pharaoh's like, are you crazy? Why would we do that? Why would we release these people? We're making a, a killing off of these folks. They're doing all of our work. Why would we release them? And so there are a series of confrontations. In fact, 10 of them, maybe you've heard of, called the 10 plagues on Egypt and so forth. Finally, Pharaoh agreed to release them after the 10th and final plague. So this is where we get into the 10th and final plague. And so I'm going to read it to you. It's called the Passover Lamb, Exodus chapter 12. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and sent them into the land of Egypt. And they said, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, they are to take one each one is to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. So now you've got the beginning of what we call what? The Passover meal. This is the explanation of it. So here they are, the Jews, uh, slaves in Egypt. God is going to deliver them, but it's going to take something spectacular for them to finally be delivered. So God is now establishing this meal as a remembrance how they are or were once slaves in Egypt and now set free. So this is what this meal is all about. So this is the very first meal, the Passover meal. So we go on. So if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in their household, according to what each one can eat. And then you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be unblemished, male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lintel of the house and which they eat. They shall eat the flesh on the same night, roasted with fire. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Don't eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its heads and its legs, along with its entrails. You shall not leave any of it until the morning. Whatever is left until the morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat in haste, for it is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you in the houses which you live, and I will see... The blood and I'll pass over, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as the feast of the Lord. Throughout your generation, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Here ends the lesson. Whoa, this is a, this is a crazy lesson. And I really hope you have some problems with this lesson. 
because you don't have some problems with this lesson, I'm going to ask you, why not? Are you kidding me? God is going to kill the firstborn boy of every family in all of Egypt. And you're sitting pretty with that? You don't have a problem with that? You should have a problem with that. We're going to come back to that in a moment because it's important for us to understand what was being spoken here. Why would God do such a thing? I want to plant that seed in your head right now. I want you to be thinking right now, why would God do this? Now, let's start with it kind of verse by verse and take a look at this. God tells Abraham, or Abraham, Moses and Aaron, his brother, and says that this month will be for you the beginning of months. Well, we know that's not true according to the Jewish calendar. First of all, the Jewish calendar is based upon a 12-month lunar calendar, which means, which means it falls short of our, our 365 day a year calendar, the way we do it right now. We, we, uh, we, have, we have a solar calendar we, about how many days the earth surrounds the sun. Well, they did it the number of uh, rotations, days in a rotation of the moon and so forth. So a little bit different way of figuring it, and that's why the calendar, the Jewish calendar is a little bit off every single year from the calendar that we celebrate. If you look at our Passover, why Passover constantly changes every year depending upon the lunar calendar, not the solar calendar. Now, if you think of the very first month, the first month is actually Rosh Hashanah. We're in that right now. September 18th is the beginning of the new year for the Jews, Rosh Hashanah. So that's not what, what God is talking about. Passover, the 10th month, is something that takes place in spring. Once again, our Christian Easter is based upon that. That's why our Easter con continually moves back and forth in dates because it's based upon the Jewish lunar calendar. But even though it wasn't the first month for them, when he says this month shall be the new beginning, it is the beginning of their freedom, their new life, their freedom from slavery. And so this is a very high and holy month for them. They are told to sacrifice a lamb, one without blemish. Don't give your leftover. Give the best. It is a sign of your gratitude. But here's a, something that I find really interesting. The lamb is ultimately not, like many sacrifices, it's not given to God. It's not given to the priest. It's not sacrificed at an altar. The family is to eat it for sustenance. It's a blessing for the family. Take the best and enjoy it for yourselves. That's what God says. Now notice the time that they were supposed to sacrifice this. At twilight, what you may or may not be aware of is that the Jewish day does not begin at midnight. The Jewish day begins at sunset. And that is the reason why if you have any Jewish friends, many times they will worship at seven, eight o'clock, whatever time it might be on Friday. It's the Sabbath day. It's their new day, their day of worship. It begins after the sun sets. So this again is reflective of their belief that it's a new day, a new day, a new season once that sun goes down. And then we go on verse 10. Uh, they're not to leave any of it for the morning. Once they have eaten their fill and they can't eat anymore, they're supposed to burn what is left. Get rid of it. Why? Because they're supposed to be prepared. And this is where we get to verse 11. God tells them that they are supposed to be prepared at any moment to leave. And if you've got all this extra baggage, you will not be able to leave in such haste as you are going to be called to leave Egypt. So they need to be prepared for the journey. Pharaoh, after all, was not going to let them go nicely. Once, of course, God strikes dead every firstborn child, every firstborn son of every Egyptian family. Do you think Pharaoh is going to be happy about that one and let them go? I don't think so. Jewish households, so that they are distinguished from Egyptian households, are to be marked with blood around the doorposts. Hence, Passover. The uh, angel of death will see the blood and pass over the Jewish homes. Then God goes on and says, this meal is to be a memorial for all times of my deliverance of you from slavery. Now, let's go back at this and loop back to the beginning. 
I planted a seed of doubt in your head. I hope I did. Why would God kill these boys? What did these Egyptian families do to them that God would take out such vengeance upon them? It seems unjust. And if you are not struck by that, I am asking you to reconsider that. You ought to be struck by how unjust a thing is, this seems to be. Most Egyptians, the average Egyptian, did nothing to oppress the Jews. One of the things that you need to understand, and I don't know, I'm going to be frank with you, I don't know whether the Passover really happened, or if there was, it's conflated, there was some uh, killing of some of the power structure, or whatever the case might be, I don't know. I don't know. The Bible tells us that all the firstborns of all of Egypt died, and, and, and that's fine. But there's no evidence of that. We've seen no evidence. The, Jew, the, the Egyptians never written about it. It seems kind of odd considering how meticulous the Egyptians were in note-taking and noting these types of things. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. But what I am telling you is that there is a purpose and a reason why the firstborn in Egypt are targeted. It's a theological, or I should say a systemic reason why. Because in Egyptian culture, the firstborn, unlike a Jewish culture, the firstborn certainly got double portion of what everybody else did, but everybody else received an inheritance too. That's not true in Egyptian culture. The firstborn received everything, all the power, all the money, everything that the father had was inherited by the firstborn. So the firstborn had absolute power. So there's a theological or structural point that God is trying to make here. God is attacking their political and oppressive hierarchical structure and saying, you know, we can't just change a few hearts. You can try to change Pharaoh's heart, but we gotta change the structure. The Bible is dealing with systemic injustice that is taking place in Egypt, and the only way to get to it is to topple the entire system of injustice. Boy, doesn't it sound like something that we're struggling with today in our country? Systemic justice, such, a, such an odd word, maybe a frustrating word for some of you. I don't know. But I'm gonna proceed here with a little bit of caution. These are not direct corollaries between the Old Testament and today. But you do need to understand that God is very concerned about systemic justice. And that's the reason why this took place. Yes, people's hearts need to be changed. But you can change somebody's hearts, but even a good person in a bad system is going to continue that bad system and bad things will happen. So I'm gonna very cautiously take a step into something very contemporary, especially as we have this conflict with the systemic injustices of our country. I know there's some people who don't believe that exists, but I'm gonna tell you how it happens. Okay, so the slaves were released in the 1800s after the, at, after the Civil War, right? Or at the end of, near the end of the Civil War by Abraham Lincoln. And oh, everybody celebrates, isn't that fantastic? But released for what? They had no homes. They had no property. They had no financial resources. They had absolutely nothing. You're free. Well, we did our job. They're free. Free for what? They've got absolutely nothing. Oh, and nobody's going to hire them. There's no way for them to start jobs because towns create what we call Jim Crow laws. Laws that prevent black people from establishing themselves. Now, I know you didn't create that. I didn't create that. But a lot of those laws still exist. And sometimes they take cover underneath uh, good sounding laws that we think sound really good, but yet we create these laws sometimes that oppress people that are poor, people that are differently colored in their skin. And we are not even aware of it. We continue to support those systems. Are we bad people? Well, we're probably nice people like most of the Egyptians were, but we are contributing to a system that oppresses 
a group of people. So this is why we have to be cautious. Yes, our hearts need to be transformed. But we also need to look at the systemic issues that create the oppression. We have to be willing to fix it. So we have this ongoing battle between, you know, some uh, politically active folks about the police. Let's just, all police are bad. Well, this is not true. But they are in a bad system and put in a difficult position because of the politics. Sometimes they're being asked to do things that are unjust. Sometimes they're not provided with the appropriate training. But remember, it's the politicians that are asking to do things, and politicians are being fed by the system that we're in. We need to break that cycle. We do need a heart transformation, but the system also needs to be fixed as well. Systems overrun even the best of people with the best of intentions. And so, in this case, in Exodus chapter 12, we are seeing God do something about the actual system after first trying to deal with the hearts. So God wants the heart of Pharaoh to change. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, it didn't change. So God is going to get up the root of the system. The root of the system of the injustice is with the firstborn son getting all the power, the absolute power, from Pharaoh to every single layer in society until you got to the Jews who had no power at all. That's what God was trying to address. So yeah, it should make us feel very uncomfortable. And I'm not certainly advocating this. This should not be a political plank for us today. Oh yeah, let's kill all the firstborn sons of all the people in power. That would not be a good thing. It would be evil. This is something that happened 3,000 years ago. Okay? It was a different system. Different politics. That's why we can't just pick up the politics of the Bible and plant it here today. But we do need to address both the heart and the system if things are going to change. So this is what I think we learned. But we also have to remind ourselves of one important thing. Even for the Jews, though, this was not done once and for all. God addressed the political system that was oppressing them but these systems keep coming back and back and back. So you replace one unjust system and one oppressor, and guess what you replace it with? Oh, another oppressor. Oh, I know, the person that you want to replace the oppressor with seems like a really nice person right now. But at some point soon, 10 years, 15 years down the road, that system that you have now created or replaced, the oppressive system in the past, will now become the oppressor too. That's because we are broken and sinful and we are greedy and hurtful. I don't care what system we replace it with, that's going to happen. And so that's why this meal must be remembered for all eternity. Because it's a reminder to us that we all contribute to these broken systems, that we are all selfish that we all need a heart transformation and we should never, ever, ever, ever depend upon a system that's made by human people to deliver justice. Ultimately, the only system that can do that is God's kingdom. And that isn't something we can create here on earth. So I know this is, this is all contained, I think, in this lesson and it's really dense and you may disagree with some of my interpretations, I get that. But I'm trying to address what was happening in the Bible and tell you that it does apply to us today. We are to remember the oppression of the Jews because it happened over and over and over and over again, hasn't it? But we need to remember that we are a part of the system sometimes that oppresses other people. It's important to remember so that we understand that God has a bigger plan. Ultimately, God needs to change our hearts Ultimately, God needs to replace our system. But that's only going to happen with the kingdom of heaven. And until that day, we need to remind ourselves of how unjust that we can be because of our human commitment to our politics and how unjustly we've treated each other. So I'm praying for God's change of heart. I am praying for a change of systems. 
We do need better systems here in this country. We have to look at one another and see how unjustly we have treated one another. We won't create perfect justice here. It's not going to happen. But we need to at least try so that people might be set free. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I know this is a very political Bible study today, but God, we need our hearts transformed. And we do need our politics transformed. I'm not recommending any particular ism or system, God. I'm not here to advocate for that. But I am saying that this system is broken in many ways. And we can't defend those things that are. We need to change those things that are broken. And they're broken all the way to the core in some cases. And we're going to replace it with a system that, guess what, is going to be broken in 10 years too. So this must be our continual reminder to ourselves. This Passover meal, that we need our hearts transformed and we need our systems transformed. And so we ask you to continue to transform us, God, and transform our attitude towards one another. Uh, for we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please go in peace. Please be kind. Amen.